Welcome to Northwood Prep School in Hertfordshire. And strange as it may seem, time teams going back to school. And we're in search of a lost Tudor palace, which some people say was more splendid than Hampton Court. Now that's a huge claim. It lies somewhere beneath these playing fields and was built by Cardinal Wolsey, Henry VIII's right-hand man. Wow, look at that! I don't think that's Tudor, do you? We're here not just to find it, but to see if the rumours are true. Was Wolsey's lost palace really grander than Hampton Court? We'll know in three days. Northwood Prep, near Rickmansworth, Hertfordshire. A small school with a big heritage. It's the site of the manor on the moor, named after the old English word for marshland. This palace was conceived in 1520 by the all-powerful religious leader and statesman, Cardinal Wolsey. In its heyday, it was an opulent playground fit for royalty and state visitors. Now, the school and English heritage have invited our slightly less stately team in to dig up the playing fields and find out just how grand the manor once was. You learn more from the depths of, about the depths of... Time Team archaeologist Phil Harding is already getting the inside track from Professor Martin Biddle, who was just a schoolboy when he excavated this site back in the 50s. <laughs> I reckon we'll see our first wall within the hour. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I, I think, think so. Yeah. Well, if, we, if it's not there, either your records are in Ah, oh, but it's been proved by the DOC. <laughs> As a 15-year-old budding archaeologist, Martin was the first to uncover Wolsey's palace. And in 1957, archaeology wasn't quite what it is today. Unbelievably, he just enlisted the help of his pals for a summer-long excavation. He knew from the records that Wolsey's palace had been demolished in the 1590s. It was his ambition to find the remains. His 1957 dig only revealed some of the walls, marked here in orange, so there's still a huge amount of the palace left to uncover. But Martin's findings did enable him to speculate about the layout of the entire building, which he recorded on the sketches made at the time. What should be this main building? So, can site director Jackie McKinley turn those dotted lines into solid lines? I mean, basically, I feel a bit like a kid in a sweet shop because <laughs> there's so many things we could go for here. It's going to, we really are going to have to focus in on particular bits of this house complex. Jackie, did you just say house? I did. <laughs> Surely we're looking for a palace, something uh, like Hampton Court. Come Hall. off it, Tony. When this house was up, it was more splendid than Hampton Court. More splendid? That's what somebody said. Jackie, how do we establish that this could be more splendid than Hampton Court? Where would you put a trench in? So the gatehouse is going to be where we're going to start from because it gives us a really good focus for getting a handle on everything else that's going yeah. on in here. Well, <laughs> if we're looking for splendour, why are we looking where... for the home of the bloke who used to well, open the door? Don't be so demotic about <laughs> it. We're coming up against the gatehouse, 50 feet high, with three levels of decoration probably on it, and the arms of the guy who owned it. This would be the first thing they would see. They'd come through this gatehouse to see the view of everything in there so the gatehouse itself is going to be a very grand place. covered with decoration it's magnificent 20 years of time team it's the first time i've been accused of being demotic <laughs> <laughs> are you happy with putting a trench in here i'm urging to get on and i'm particularly pleased that you are demotic <laughs> <laughs> Don't just <laughs> let's get on with it yes. <laughs> Jackie can already add to what she knows from Martin's dig with some geophys that the school commissioned last year. The radar suggests a large structure underground that could be the foundations of a building 50 metres by 60 metres surrounded by a moat. It's an enormous site to survey, so it's going to be a real challenge to piece together a layout and find clues to what it once looked like. 
So where better to start than the grand entrance? That'll come up nice and straight, cos the edge is straight already. Martin's 1957 dig found some remnants of a gatehouse on the west side, but the remains weren't well preserved. So Jackie's put Phil in charge of digging the other side of the gatehouse. But that's the way you take the truck. I mean, look at that, that'll go back now. It won't know it's been shifted. To understand Cardinal Wolsey's obsession with grandiose architecture, we have to look at another of his masterpieces and his power base, Hampton Court. His grand design for Hampton Court was to emulate the greatest Renaissance architecture, a palace that would impress visitors of the highest orders from church and state. From what we know from our dig so far, there's every reason to think that the Manor of the Moor was built with the same aspirations. We know it was popular with King Henry VIII and Wolsey was his most trusted statesman. And like Hampton Court, it was built in order to entertain, with courtyards and accommodation for guests. Thomas More and Catherine of Aragon would have known this palace intimately. Legend has it that in 1527, a French ambassador who stayed at the Manor of the Moor declared it was more splendid than Hampton Court. The question we're asking is which was grander? And already Phil's hit something just a few centimetres into the school turf. And it, Phil. Ah! Oh, I say, that's brilliant, isn't it? Well, it's absolutely spot on. What we got is the corner of a room of your gatehouse. Right. There's the outside wall of the gatehouse. Yeah. So if you're arriving at the, at the place, you ride up or walk up through there. Yeah. And here is the actual corner of the gatehouse itself. There's the wall, and you're standing on the wall that's actually going to go all, all right. the way round. So I guess, you know, when His Majesty parades up through there, his, his retainer, who's living in or uh, inhabiting this little room, goes out through a doorway and doffs his cap oh, to His it. Majesty. Yep. Phil's uncovering walls that belong to the eastern half of the gatehouse. Their layout ties in with the geophys and mirrors what Martin found to the west. From other Tudor palaces, Jackie knows there would have been towers on this gatehouse. Evidence of a tower will help us understand the scale of the palace entrance. Now Jack is all set to plunder the heart of the palace in search of what could be the most ostentatious rooms. The GFIs hints at two of them. Jackie believes the larger one to the east is Wolsey's chapel and the one to the west could be the Great Hall. So Matt sets to work digging for the Great Hall and traces on a hunt for the chapel. Will either trench turn up any clues of palace splendour? From the inside. So earlier in the 15th century, you put sort of gallery. Away from the hustle and bustle of the dig, historians Kent Rawlinson and Susie Lipscomb have uncovered vital Tudor records about the palace layout. We've got this survey that was done under Elizabeth I and it describes all the buildings that were at the Manor of the Moor. It explains that there's a principal gatehouse and lodgings on either side with two towers and, and explains lodgings on the east and west of the said quadrant with a tower at each end of the same adjoining upon the moat. And finally it makes a mention of a long gallery on the north side of the house into the garden with two turrets at the north end of the same and says so that it's in length it is 253 feet. That is very big, isn't it? How does that tie in to what we've got here? Well, what's wonderful about this is it's so detailed and it makes us realise that what we've previously been looking at, this sort of mooted site, can't... all these buildings can't fit in there. Sure. So it means we have to sort of rethink. Ah. Um, so here we have a new revised idea which is basically three times the size. So we've got a base court down here in the bottom, um, the original moated site in the centre, and then the great 
long gallery above. Why is this called the base court? It basically means base in the sense of the lower sort of oh, court. The lower court, yeah. yeah. Um, and even more exciting, not only do you have this gatehouse, but you seem to have these four large towers sort of marking out this whole new structure that we didn't previously know about. The Elizabethan survey transforms what we know about Wolsey's palace. Not only do we have to radically extend our plan of the palace, but it makes our search all the more challenging. While the documents tell of a long gallery running off to the north, we've no real idea what it would have looked like. And to the south, there was a lower or base court. We'd expect this building to contain lodgings for guests and to surround a courtyard. It's marked on the historic plan, but Martin's 1957 dig never found it in the ground. So the lost base court is Jackie's next target. But it's a huge, sprawling site, so the pressure's really on for the Geophys team to give us some clues about where to start digging. What kind of Geophys are you using? Um, we're going to use the radar again, which is what we used uh, when we were looking at the main house in the previous survey. And remind me... I say remind me, I don't really know at all. <laughs> How does radar work, Jimmy? Um, it's very much like air traffic control. So instead of firing radio waves into the sky and bouncing them off aeroplanes, we've turned it upside down, we're firing it into the ground, and by building up the data, we can strip away all the soil and just leave the archaeology, so we'll have a model of what is under the ground without actually having to take all the soil off, which obviously is a bit tricky in three days. So anyway, I'll push my merry way along here, and, uh, and hopefully in a few hours' time, we, uh, we'll have a base court for you to look at. Christian. We're near the end of day one, and we've got a huge search on for a base court that hasn't been seen for over 400 years. But we can safely say that Wolsey's lost palace is no longer lost. And we're turning up clues that could tell us how much money he lavished on his manor. Rumour has it that they've come up with our first splendid find here in Trench One. Stay oh. there. <laughs> this actually is how Paul spends a lot of his time on site. It's true. Show me this find. It's wonderful. Oh, I think that's wheelbarrow. What we have got, all the way from the Netherlands, some really quite spectacular floor tile. Wow. That's probably 16th century or thereabouts. Am I allowed to lick my finger and...? As long as you do it very gently, yeah. It's quite oh. fragile, this stuff, so be, be careful with it. Those colours are absolutely fantastic. fantastic isn't it? Yeah, it's great, basically yeah. a white tin glaze, and then that decoration is hand painted with different coloured pigments. It's cobalt, it's ochre, it's copper, you know, it's. it's so it's, it's expensive. Oh, yeah, it's baked <laughs> in. I mean, it's the sort of thing you only find in a spectacularly posh palace or something like that, mm. which is a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are in a spectacular posh palace, yeah. What can we tell from this find? Well, the interesting thing about this is, that although it's a little bit broken up, it doesn't look like it's been very knocked about. So it doesn't look like it's mm. travelled very far. Now, it suggests that it could actually have come from inside the gatehouse itself. Now, gatehouses weren't just a way into somewhere. They also quite frequently had the most spectacular fancy, fancy rooms for guests to stay in yeah. and lodgings. And this could actually have come from this lodgings within the gatehouse. Mm. Cardinal Wolsey might actually have trodden on that, which might be why it broke. <laughs> it's an exciting clue to the scale and grandeur of the gatehouse. But just how large this entrance was and what it looked like is still all in doubt. Phil's got two days to find out. Beginning of day two here in Hertfordshire, where we're looking for Cardinal Wolsey's long-lost palace, which reputedly was even more fabulous than Hampton Court. Was that true? Well, that's what we're here to find out. So we're geophysing and digging like mad to prove how extensive the palace was. We're beginning to discover it had stately lodgings for Wolsey's many guests. And the history books are throwing up some clues about who those guests were and the role the manner of the Moor played on the European political stage. In 1525, Henry VIII was making claims on French territory. 
With the prospect of the country being dragged into a conflict, Woolsey broke at a high-level meeting between the two old adversaries right here at the Manor of the Moor. And Susie's found the paperwork to prove it. It's in Latin, I know that. What is it? This is the Treaty of the Moor. This is an Anglo-French treaty that basically sums up that Henry is going to give up his territorial claims on France for a little while in exchange for a very large pension of £20,000. Which would have been a huge amount of money at that time. Yeah, his, his annual revenues were £110,000. This is really significant. And it was right here that it was signed? Absolutely. It actually says here, at the moor, on the 30th of August, 1525. Cardinal Wolsey sealed the treaty in the presence of some of the biggest Tudor figures of the day. So we've got, for example, William, Archbishop of Canterbury. We've got Thomas, Duke of Norfolk. And, let's see, here's a name you might recognise. Thomas More. So this is like the EU, isn't it? All the politicians and the bureaucrats steam over and have loads of food and all the bureaucrats sign the paper. Yes, absolutely, and you can see how bureaucratic it is just by the length of the document. <laughs> and at the very end of it, we've got the French envoy, Johannes Joachim, who's signed it, and this is his seal. But the signing and sealing was worth nothing without the pomp and ceremony that Susie believes would have followed it in the palace chapel, in front of a multitude of courtiers and dignitaries. Rakshar's been roped in. So, <laughs> let's imagine that you're the French envoy. Yes. So I'm going to take your hand. Yes. And if you could just be uh, Wolsey for the moment, and we'd put your hands together like this, and this, by this, you, you swear uh, to keep peace between you. I will give you £20,000. In exchange, will you promise not to attack me? Sounds like a good deal. Thank I, you very much. I will. And that was actually what would confirm that the treaty had taken place. There's just two days remaining of our dig here in the grounds of Northwood School, and there's still an awful lot to do. In Phil's Trench, they're investigating the remains of what's thought to be an elaborate gatehouse. Oh, is that a toil? Oh, oh what a... Oh, oh, what an absolute gem. Oh, and that's, that's glazed, isn't it? Yep. Oh, good man. And that's on the... Oh, the that's on the same level. level as that bit of flooring over there. Plus, we've got those fragments up there. It actually confirms that we are in a room and it tells us so much more about what that room would have looked like. We, yeah. we, now, we now know what the floor looked like. Yeah. Spot on. Oh, look, oh, this is getting good stuff. This is all positive stuff particularly since the accounts that describe the fate of the Manor of the Moor paint a grim picture. In the late 16th century, it was systematically dismantled and the materials were sold off. And it's thought that much of what remained of the stone was robbed and reused. So that's a big problem for our team. Is there enough remaining in the ground to determine the true scale of the palace? And could this explain why, in some key locations, geophys aren't finding anything? Well, I guess the big question is, have we got the base cord? <laughs> you tell us. Um, there could be quite a small answer to that yeah. question. So this is the data where we filled in the gap, um, butting up against where we surveyed over the house before. Um, we've got the cricket pitch. And other than that, you know, there's not a huge amount that jumps out at us. If we presented those results to you without being told there was a base court and an outer gateway, we'd say there's nothing there. Yeah. The thing is, it's likely that this area is going to have been preferentially robbed out, and that includes the towers. If you're now telling us that it may well have been robbed out totally, then we're on to a loser. <laughs> we might as well tear up the geophysics for this area. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't. We did know that this that this was potentially spurious size-wise. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we said. Potentially we... spurious, it's... <laughs> but it could actually be the same size as the moat and be here. Well, we're moving the goalposts all the time, aren't we? Um... That's what you have to do when you're losing badly, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the last throw of the dice would be to ask John and Jimmy to complete the geophys on either side? Well, I mean, just one side might, might do. So you'll have done that in about an hour, won't you? <laughs> He's <laughs> not very happy about that, does he? <laughs> I don't think there's any chance they'd want to help. 
Jack is ramping up the pressure on the GFIS team to track down the base court. Now the most likely place to find any remains is over one of its towers next to the moat. So by the time Jim has pushed the radar around there, he'll be on his way to clocking up 16 kilometres geophysing. But, sore feet or not, we have to locate the base court to prove it was here at all. I came out of one of those doors in... There July is, though, some evidence of Tudor splendour that we don't need to dig for. I couldn't believe my eyes. Oh, wow! I mean, look at them. They are huge. And look at this unbelievable carving. And I looked at that with Trevor. These remains of stone pillars have survived for four centuries hidden in the undergrowth until they were discovered recently by a school groundsman. This is the kind of decoration that you see being imported from Italy. So it's basically a sort of a copy of Roman decoration. So you've got this beautiful palmette here at the top, and then this, these vegetal swirls coming into flowers on either side, and then the whole thing tied together with a canthus leaf. So this is absolutely typical of sort of a revival of that sort of classical Renaissance style. And what's astonishing about this is that this is the, sort of the first huge physical manifestation of that. These are monumental. And going back to Hampton Court, we have most of the main entrances from Hampton Court, and there's nothing like this at Hampton Court. Do you think you can find the sites of where these came from on the building? The gatehouse would be an absolute classic place, or the entrances to things like your main hall or your main chapel. And they're going to be pretty big recesses that these are going to be fitted into. I think it's going to stand out. It should stand out like a sore thumb. These carvings are evidence that Woolsey was one of the first in Britain to use Italian Renaissance-style architecture. Jackie's theory is that these magnificent pillars stood on pedestals beside the entrances of Woolsey's palace. If she's right, they'd be grander than the doorways at Hampton. So could the pillar bases be in our gatehouse? Woolsey wanted to create a playground on a par with Hampton Court. The manor of the Moor's 600 acres of parkland was exclusively for the use of Woolsey and his guests. To get the best view of it, Susie and Emma are on the fairway of a local golf course. With the help of some historical maps, Emma's created a 3D model of the manor's parkland. So you can see the Moor is down here with the moat. Uh-huh. And I think we are somewhere up here. Oh, OK. It gives a real sense of the a sort of rolling landscape around yeah. here, doesn't it? I mean, it is massive, this park. There's, a, there's an account of Woolsey having sort of 400 or 500 deer in this park. Gosh, and actually, at, at one point when the, um, the palings, the sort of railings around it, have, have been dilapidated, to replace them, they need to knock down 200 oak trees. Gosh. Uh, so that kind of gives some sense of the scale. And this map gives us a vision of what Woolsey's park would have looked yeah, like. Yeah. When Woolsey came here and brought Henry VIII here, it was exactly for those hunting and, and going out, doing some hawking, doing some falconry. Just, to just showing off, basically. Capturing game. Over, yeah. And it's just fun. We're nearly halfway through our dig, and usually on Time Team, we get a bird's eye view of our site with a helicopter. But we're always up for trying out new technology, so this time we've opted for a spy plane. Will it help us find that elusive base court? So what have you got on it? Uh, well, we've got a camera to take the images. We have an onboard computer, so the aircraft is in communication with my PC while it's in the air. So if the wind speed gets too high, I get the warning and I can do something about it. So is it ready to fly? Uh, yes. Where should I stand? Just behind me, please. OK. So it chocks away. Well, not quite. It's a bizarre way to start the engine. Movement triggers the motor into action. And a flight plan sends the polystyrene drone cruising at a height of 400 feet, where it'll take a snap of our sight every four seconds, all to see the lie of the land. 
I'm now going to initiate landing, so if everybody could just stand behind me, please. No, it's incredibly light, isn't it? Just like picking up a piece of cardboard. Yeah, it is indeed, yeah. Just maybe it'll see something that geophysics can't. Well, now, after the break. Afternoon of day two, and we're digging up these school playing fields here in Hertfordshire and finding Cardinal Wolsey's Lost Palace, which once dominated this view. We sent a camera-equipped drone up, and amazingly, the photos do reveal faint traces of the palace's northern edge. A ghostly scar in the turf from four centuries earlier. But in the south, there's no sign of the base court, the palace's grandiose centrepiece where Wolsey received his guests. At Phil's Trench, over the palace gatehouse, there's some good news. We have got the grandest gateway of any building this side of London. It is immense. See, I knew he'd sort us out. Go and show me, show me all about it. OK, the first thing we've got to, got to think about is that the fact that the bridge would have been coming in across the moat where our water bottles are, somewhere there. Now, here, this is the most exciting part. We have got the foundations of an enormous tower. That would have been massive, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And the nice thing about it too, look, got part of the floor as well. Oh, that's You see? Yeah, yeah. Part of the floor tile. So that is probably the level at which, I don't know, Cardinal Wolsey's guard would have had his breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and what have you got up the other well, trench? Anybody coming here would have paraded through that main corridor, right the way through, and then they would have exited through there, out into this inner courtyard. But what is really, really nice is, do you see we got that square yeah. box there? Now, funnily enough, Martin had a similar feature like that over there in the 1950s. We've got a pair of them, and we've measured up with the, with the stone columns. We think that that is probably where those two massive columns would have gone up either side of the gateway. Um, it's just superb. Phil's completed an enormous piece of the jigsaw. It's likely that the stone columns in the schoolyard would have stood on the square bases either side of the gatehouse. So by adding the stone columns, we not only have the dimensions of Wolsey's doorway, we can reconstruct it in all its Renaissance glory. The gateway would have witnessed many a state reception, but not all were celebratory. As a prelude to divorcing his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, King Henry banished her here to the manor of the moor. Catherine had failed to produce a son, and Henry was already courting his next wife-to-be. Catherine was kept here for two years. We can assume that being in the house and the care of the head of the church kept the worst of the scandal at bay. Now Phil's extending the trench to see if the entire gatehouse matches the splendour of Wolsey's grand doorway. We know most of the finery of the palace was sold off or robbed, which may account for the lack of objects in the ground. But in the chapel trench, traces found remnants that would have been of little interest to the robbers, but helped tell us something about the chapel's decoration. Have you got trace? It is another piece of window glass. Another piece? It's prompted some excitement from Time Team's small finds expert, Danny Wooten. Oh, my goodness. Isn't it gorgeous? That is amazing. I mean, the thing that gets me is the patterning on that is so clear. I mean, it's as if it was painted yesterday. Wow. Brilliant, isn't it? Look at that. Look, I'm actually looking through a piece of window that Cardinal Wolsey <laughs> or Henry VIII or Catherine looked through. That is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> a fragment of stained glass, a tiny link to this palace's illustrious past, perhaps a remnant of a large east-facing chapel window. Over halfway through our dig, and we're desperate to locate the base court. 
Tudor documents tell us that Woolsey built it here. But Jackie wants to find physical remains to add to what's known about the layout of the palace. So she's scouring the southern playing fields for any other clues. Hang on, where is it? Here we are, look. Is that one of those bits of door surround, or is that something else? Because it's definitely being worked, is not it? Yeah. I think it's a bit of window. I think that's a slot for the glazing oh, yes. right. of a window to okay. come in. OK, that's Let's amazing, that. because, I mean... That's a new discovery, just spotted just, here. Just lying on the surface. A window frame and more columns all in the vicinity of the base court. But Kent's made a more intriguing find. We have accounts at Hampton Court when they're cobbling the base court in the 1530s for river cobbles like this being collected. So people actually paid to go out into fields, gather these pebbles, put them in baskets and then sort of sell them um, to the office of work, so the laying of the courtyard. So if these cobbles are of the kind of sort that we find at Hampton Court, then here they've just moved potentially from the base court over there, just as literally a stone throw away. Yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah. but with yeah. that flag Maybe is just there, been isn't it? Yeah. sort of cleared or dug up at some point and just dumped here. Tudor cobblestones from a courtyard found tantalisingly close to the area where that base court ought to be. So far, we've just got a gaping hole on our palace plan. So to attempt to prove the size of the palace, Jack has decided to go for broke and dig up the last key building in the complex that, according to the documents, is supposed to be here. This is the long gallery, right? This is the long gallery. Absolutely. What was the long gallery for? It's basically for recreation, but it's almost... It doesn't have a particular purpose. It's architecture for architecture's sake. It's one-third of the size of the palace, and it just stretches out into the garden. They don't perform any real function? You just walk all the way to the end of a gallery and then walk all the way back? They're there to be beautiful and stunning. They're there to take your breath away. That's a function. How do we find it? Well, we've got a number of problems here. One is that, unfortunately, the geophysics can't pick anything up in the astroturf, and in fact, the geophysics hasn't picked up anything at all. So our starting point is going to be the pier that Martin picked up in the 1950s, which is where the bridge was, and that's the point that we've got marked here. So we would be essentially standing on the bridge going over the moat, the gallery going over the moat. So the gallery is over there. So we shoot off there. in that direction. Yeah, we need sorry. to go round the outside yeah. and come through at the other end there. Jackie's best guess is that the long gallery stretched from the bridge, across the moat and out through a private garden. At a length of 253 feet, it was one of the most flamboyant parts of the palace. Now, if you look back, can you see the machine all the way down there? That's at the gatehouse. That just gives you the sense of scale of the whole site. It's massive. So where are you going to put in a trench? Well, what I want to do, first of all, is put a long, a, a long slit trench just this side of the AstroTurf to get the width of that gallery within the Privy Garden. Without Geophys to go on, Jackie's trench will only be a stab in the dark. But if she finds it, she'll be uncovering one of the longest Tudor galleries in Britain. Beginning of day three here at Northwood Preparatory School in Hertfordshire, and I'm about to take you on a tour of Cardinal Wolsey's Lost Palace. Beyond the tennis court, there would have been the Great Gallery, an incredibly long covered walkway, about 250 feet long, which was very elegant and actually totally pointless. It didn't really lead anywhere. Over here is what we're calling the the Chapel Trench, a very important international treaty was signed there. This is my favourite trench. You've got more foundations in there, a massive buttress, and that supported the great entranceway to the entire palace. But in our quest to fill out the palace plan, Jackie needs to prove the existence of the Long Gallery. We know from the Tudor records it was made of wood and stood on timber pillars. So Jack has decided to send Rakshar's team off on a mission to look for evidence of these pillars. The trouble is, the best spot to dig is the other side of the tennis court, which could be tricky for our digger. Oh! As they fight their way through to dig up the long gallery, on the other side of the site, Jack has decided to put in yet another trench. 
we're going to put in one last trench, which Jackie thinks might be the outside of the base court, although John thinks it could be a pipeline. Jackie, <laughs> what is it we've got? Well, if you look on here, can you see how there's this line going down there? If I put that in there, this is what the geophysics has picked up, and that line is precisely in line with one of the walls of our main building complex. Now, it does make it a big base court, about the same size as Hampton Court. Ah. <laughs> John, that is beguiling, isn't it? Well, yeah, but Jimmy is absolutely convinced that that is um, a pipe or, at best, a conduit. He doesn't think it's the wall of a building. There's only one way to test it, though. Yeah. And there is quite a deal of money on this, Absolutely. Isn't there? Five pounds has been wagered. I'm yeah. not sure I signed it for that. <laughs> but this is our last chance, isn't it, to wow. establish whether or not we can find the base court. It, it is so compelling, the lining up, I think it'd be a mistake not to have a look. So the final trench goes in over a radar trace that lines up with the edge of the main palace. If this is a palace wall, then it would make the base court much larger than Jackie expected and it's her last chance to take a look. Back in the jungle behind the tennis courts, there are further delays in digging up the long gallery. Rakchars had to call in the school groundsman for some tree clearance. they finally hit something. I don't think that's Tudor, do you? Yeah. No. But there's no doubt the tower that Phil's digging in the gatehouse is Tudor. He's uncovered the place where it meets the moat and is puzzling over the final clues as to what the gatehouse once looked like. What I'm not so sure about is, is what this this projection of brickwork is coming out here. It, it could be part of the tower. At the moment, what I just like is a, a moment of patient oh, quiet to allow me to continue with my labours. I'll get back in my own. You, right. <laughs> but as the hours run out, the search for our long gallery is becoming ever more urgent. Hiya. I'm an emissary from a faraway palace. Oh, it actually is pretty far away, isn't it? About 150 yards away. Um, people are wondering uh, why you're not getting on quicker, to put it politely. Are you kidding me? No, well... Look I at mean... us! We're in the middle of a wood. We've had to chop down trees. We've had to get rid of vegetation. And we've... We, look, we've started the trench and we're down onto this. It's proper archaeology. Listen, it's not... It's not me. I'm not having a go. <laughs> the observation simply is that it's very late, and if this trench doesn't get underway fairly soon, then actually we're not going to be able to finish it by the time we leave. Is Paul doing anything? I'm waiting, Tony. Believe it or not, he's actually <laughs> quiet for once, which is a night, Paul. But the good thing is we have got building debris starting to turn up here, which is a really good thing. Rakshar, is that, is that not a piece of glazed tile down by your foot by any chance, is it? Yes, it is! <laughs> <laughs> Believe me or not, that wasn't rehearsed. <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's have Actually, a look. I think it's just dropped a little bit out of the section there, so... But you can see it's got the green glaze on it. It's, it I'll have to say it cleaned up, but I think it's early 16th. Do you want to get up and come over and have a look at it, or are you fine from where you I'm are? I'm fine from it's here, Tony. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that, that is the kind of thing we would have had on the floors of the gallery anyway, so... Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the yellow tiles we're getting all over the site, you know, from the yellow and green checkerboard floor. Yeah, so, yeah. early 16th century, right where yeah. we want to be, yeah? So, the job's getting done rather well. Congratulations, it's a fantastic trench. How fast you're working. I'll go away <laughs> and shut up. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> and over in Tracy's trench, the digging's almost done. As well as evidence of a chapel, she's also uncovered a massive chunk of building. Tracy, this corner really is impressive, isn't it? It is. I mean, look at the size of this wall. This is fantastic. This is where Martin put his trench in the 50s. Yeah. Um, and so we've, we've come in on the same place, but we've extended, so we've got the whole sweep going off that way, and then the turn coming underneath your feet. So what's that little square there? Uh, that would be the buttress, just to support the corner turn of the wall. 
This trench confirms Martin's work and adds a buttress and a palace corner to the plan. The foundations were built for strength, able to support two storeys and enclose a great hall and a chapel, all of it designed to impress Wolsey's international visitors. But what about the bet on finding that base court? We got our base court, John. Where's the fiver? It's a, it's a pipe. No, it's a culvert. Uh, what is a culvert? Well, it's a brick built. Um, culvert, it's a channel, it's a drain. Ah. Um, could it be old? Well, the bricks don't look modern. They could be reused. Or it could be Tudor. Could be Tudor. But whatever it is, it's not our base court. It's not the wall of the base court, no. And uh, Jimmy gets his fiver. No, I get the fiver. He said pipe. I said co conduit. Oh, it's just a nonsensical semantic debate between GFIs. Typical. Just keep scraping, will you? Keep just tell Jackie so shows us a fiver. <laughs> <laughs> so Jackie's out of luck and out of pocket. It's almost the end of our dig, and while it's home time for some, there's still all to play for in the Long Gallery. Have we come anywhere as far as the Long Gallery is concerned? Well, we had quite high hopes this afternoon because in the area here, we'd got quite a few bits of building debris. We had quite a, a lot of chalk spread, including that, that nice piece, of nice pieces of tile, but it's kind of disappeared, isn't it? It has disappeared. We kind of came down onto this lovely kind of chalk spread that we thought was possibly a chalk raft that the timber gallery would have sat on top of and we did actually get what seemed to be post holes coming through we've half sectioned them no dating evidence it's looking more like cardinal Wolsey's gazebo rather than a gallery so it was always going to be a long shot on the long gallery um, and unfortunately, because it's very ephemeral, and we didn't know exactly where it was because we had limited, limited evidence, so I'm afraid in this case we seem to have drawn a blank. Occasionally on time teams, there are moments where you have to admit that you've found absolutely nothing. And in this little area, this is one of those times. <laughs> So, no long gallery and no base court. Not even a trace on the geophys. It's certainly unlucky and not what we were expecting. But deep in the foundations of the gatehouse, Phil and his team have uncovered the front of a great tower. Um, well, you were asking me, how can we think about... Sort of With Ken's help, he's working out its unusual layout. Um, this is Oxborough Hall in Norfolk and it's very like what we're dealing with here. It's a sort of a mooted site and you can see the way that the ranges, as we think here, sort of come right up to the moot, so they sort of disappear, you get this beautiful reflection. Um, but then it's also got this fantastic gatehouse. This is obviously yeah. the bit that actually interests me, the gatehouse, because, you know, obviously, somehow or another, I've got to try and visualise what happens going up in the sky. All I've got is the foundation. Yeah. But Ah, what's that one? Well, this is the oh, detail of the great house. Does that help? Oh, what? And um, it's got these turrets, and you were, you're thinking that you might have a turret here as well. Uh, well, I know I've got a turret here. How many sides have you got on here? One, two, three, four, five. It's basically octagonal. Isn't it? It's an octagonal. Well, I know that I've got four sides, uh, at least. I've got four sides at the bottom, because I, I've got one in there, yep. then there's one going back parallel with the edge of the trench, and then the one we knew about going back there. So we got one, yeah. two, three, four. Yeah. So we've definitely got one half yeah, of an so octagon. Yes, you've got half a turret. I mean, the issue, the other thing too, is it, it's got this sense of the buildings coming right up to the moat, which yeah, we've absolutely. got no evidence for in the, in the geophysics. We've got evidence for a back wall, but we don't have any evidence for the front wall actually fronting onto the moat. Do you think that's just because they've fallen into the moat over time? We've literally lost an entire wall, yeah. probably not far off the line of these bricks here, just bordering along the side of the moat. Which is exactly what you can see here. They say a picture tells a thousand words. That picture tells me 10,000 words. It really does. <laughs> Thank you. 
Back in the 1950s, Martin Biddle dug up half of the gatehouse. Now Phil's trench helps reveal Woolsey's gatehouse in its full symmetrical glory. We've discovered it had two octagonal towers built to rise straight up out of the water. It was a jewel of Tudor splendour and a statement of wealth designed to impress any visitor. It's not been an easy dig. Centuries of the site being robbed have made it difficult to prove the Tudor accounts of a base court to the south and a long gallery that graced the gardens to the north. But our finds do give us a glimpse of Woolsey's opulence. Fine floors, ornate stonework, and gorgeous stained glass windows. Was it more splendid than Hampton Court? Well, only that 16th century visitor could really tell. Our dig leaves a legacy for Northwood School, the guardian of this special site. We've added new colour to the story of Cardinal Wolsey and to the role the Manor of the Moor played in some of the most dramatic events in Tudor history. There's a new time for the Time Team from next Sunday, 3.55. We look at previously unseen footage and examine what can be done to defend our planet. Meteor strike, fireball from space at 8. But next today, looking for riches that are out of this world in Deal or No Deal.